So as I said, this is the second of our four election forums, and tonight is devoted to the Washington State Court of Appeals, the Whatcom County Prosecuting Attorney, the PUD Commissioner, and the Whatcom County Council at Large Elections. So the last thing, the last formality I want to remind you about is that the forums are the property of the League of Women Voters of Bellingham, Whatcom County, and of the City of Bellingham, and they may not be used in any manner without specific written permission from both parties. So that was, that was the serious stuff. And what I'd like to do now is hand over to our first moderator, Jill Bernstein, longtime league member and former president. And she is going to moderate the debate for the Washington State Court of Appeals district judge. Jill will introduce the candidates and she'll explain the debate rules for you. And then she will also manage the question period afterwards. Thanks, Jill. And thank you, Heather. What a pleasure it is to be here this evening. As Heather mentioned, our first race of the evening are the candidates for the Washington Court of Appeals. That's Division One, District Three, Judge Position One. There are two candidates on the ballot for this race. They are the candidates Cecily Hazelrig Hernandez and Tom Seguine. A little description about what this office is and what the Court of Appeals judges do. Um, voters should know that most cases are appealed from the Superior Court to go directly to the Court of Appeals, so those certain specific types of cases go directly to the Supreme Court. The Court decides each case after reviewing the transcript of the record in the Superior Court and considering the arguments of the parties. The Court is organized into three divisions with headquarters located in Seattle, Tacoma, and Spokane respectively. Each division is divided into three districts with a specified number of judges, each elected to a six-year term, and the annual salary is $181,263 each year. So for our debate this evening, candidates will have up to two minutes each for an opening statement. They will have one minute to respond to each question and will make a one-minute closing statement. Each candidate has a challenge card. Candidates, would you hold up your challenge cards? There you go. Uh, candidates may use this card to challenge or rebut their opponent's response. The challenging candidate will have 45 seconds to state the challenge, and his opponent will have 45 seconds to respond to the challenge. Each candidate may use their challenge card one time during the question and answer period. Candidates, simply hold up your card when you wish to challenge your opponent on a particular question. Now, the most important people in the room are actually our timers. This is Michelle Kopcha and Carol Komu, uh, and they are seated here right in front of me, and they're gonna be tracking the time. The timers will flash a yellow sign. You wanna hold those up for us? when 15 seconds remain, and a red sign to signal time is up. If a candidate continues to talk, a bell will be rung. And that means really stop, that means really stop talking. We ask that the candidates be respectful of the time allotted due to the limited amount of time that we have and our desire to include as many questions as possible. Now for you, the audience, an important goal of the league is civil discussion. To that end, we ask that those in the audience be respectful and refrain from comments, as well as hold their applause until the conclusion of each segment of the forum. We encourage members of the audience to provide written questions for the candidates. Questions you submit will be asked of all of the candidates. Ushers are available, as I mentioned, to pick up your questions and bring them to the screeners at the table on currently my left. Uh, and uh, don't worry, as soon as you hold your card up, we're gonna have an usher come and grab your card and bring it forward, and our goal is to ask as many questions as we can this evening. Questions will be, sque will be screened by league members Judy Hopkinson and Kirsten Barron. They will be screening for legibility and clarity and to avoid duplication. Now, to begin, candidates rolled the dice as they walked in the door here this evening, and the high roller had the choice of going first with their opening statement or having the last closing statement. Candidate Seguin will go first, and after we start, we will alternate the order for our candidates' responses. So with the rules covered, let's get started. Timers, are you ready? You're ready, okay. So, 
turning now to face you. And uh, we will start then with candidate Seguin. And, and Ms. Hazelrig Hernandez, may I call you Ms. Hernandez? Yes, please. Thank you. So Mr. Seguin, your two minute uh, opening statement. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Tom Seguin. Uh, I am a candidate for the Court of Appeals position in District 3 of Division 1. I am asking you to consider supporting me tonight because I am the candidate uh, that's in the race who has the broadest level of experience for this position. That includes 30 years of the practice of law um, in these uh, four counties, Skagit Island, Whatcom, and San Juan. Uh, more importantly, that practice includes uh, broad exposure and experience in many different areas of law. As Ms. Bernstein just mentioned, this, case, this position reviews the work of other attorneys and judges, and I believe, and I think you will if you study the position, that it's very important for someone to have a very broad, diverse background because, after all, you are reviewing the work of other professionals in this field. Uh, my candidacy is also broadly supported by many uh, officials and dignitaries, uh, many of which are in your community. The district court judges here have all endorsed me. Uh, Prosecutor McEachran, Sheriff Elfo, uh, there are others. Most importantly in the primary, uh, there were 29,000 people who supported me, which was 5,000 more than any other candidate. So uh, some other people have already studied the ballot and studied what I've put in my voters pamphlet, which is basically what I've just described to you, and I'm asking you to do that. Uh, the last thing about me is that I'm a resident of Bow and uh, no, have lived here uh, since 1990 and uh, have worked in all these four counties uh, professionally, and I have a very good sense of them. I know everyone, not everyone, but most of the people in the legal community, and I think that provides me or, uh, makes me uniquely qualified to represent the people of those four counties. Thank you. We're gonna again ask everybody to please hold your applause and your comments until after this debate is completely finished. And now uh, candidate Hernandez, your Thank two you. minute opening. My name is Cecily Hazelrig Hernandez. Uh, I was born and raised on Whidbey Island. My dad was a Navy pilot. My folks got stationed up here from Texas, and that's what brought my family to the Pacific Northwest. I attended Oak Harbor Schools kindergarten through 12th grade, graduating from Oak Harbor High School, and then moved to the mainland in Skagit County, where I attended the Skagit Valley College Paralegal Program. I was a young single mom at that time, and so I was really just focused on building a career that would be focused on service, but would allow me to provide for myself and my daughter. Um, I fell in love with the law, and I continued to complete my bachelor's degree at Western Washington University in American Cultural Studies and we lived in Whatcom County until I graduated, and then we moved to Spokane where I completed my law degree. As an undergraduate and as a law student, I lived and studied in Mexico at different universities there. Um, that prepared me to uh, pursue a career in um, social justice work. I wanted to use my law degree to reach out to the community, particularly marginalized communities. Um, as such, I'm currently a Skagit County Public Defender in the felony unit. I'm one of the bilingual attorneys. So I represent my clients in their primary language in terms of meeting with them, discussing their cases, reviewing discovery, what have you. Certainly, we use interpreters in the courtroom where proceedings are conducted in English. Um, I started my work as an attorney, however, up here in Whatcom County, I was a small business owner. I opened a law firm where I did family-based immigration petitions and assisted citizens and residents with um, sponsoring qualifying family members for immigration into the United States. During this time, I also became an adjunct instructor at Western Washington University Fairhaven College for Interdisciplinary Studies. I'm the mother of two children. I'm a grandmother of a recently one-year-old baby girl. Um, my family has lived and worked and um, served in this community for years, and I would love the opportunity to continue to do so at the Court of Appeals. Thank you, uh, both candidates. Now you will each have 60 seconds to respond to the questions, and we'll start with Mr. Seguin. Our first question is this. As we opened our proceedings this evening, this, this evening, we put our hands over our heart and we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag with uh, liberty and justice for all. Access to justice is one of the core concepts in our legal system. Um, in, 
telling us that everyone is entitled to the protections of the law. What have you personally done to improve access to justice? Well, I have uh, represented many, many people over the years uh, on, uh, without providing payment to me. Um, I'm forgetting the phrase that we use there anyway. Um, Pro bono, excuse me. Yeah, uh, many, many folks pro bono, thank you. There's <laughs> some people murmuring out in the crowd there. Uh, lots of cases I've handled pro bono. I've, I've done volunteer work for the uh, Skagit Volunteer Lawyer Program. Uh, I have served as a prosecutor in Whatcom County and in uh, Skagit County for long periods of time. And during that time, I uh, often had to work with people who do not have their own attorneys and cannot afford to have them. So I learned firsthand that those people, as well as any other folks who have money, deserve access to justice, and I've provided it to them uh, in that role. And candidate Hernandez. Thank you. As I indicated, I'm a Skagit County Public Defender. I have been for about eight years starting in the misdemeanor unit. Uh, my work is entirely based on representing indigent people accused of crimes in Skagit County. That was incredibly important to me um, because that is a, absolutely a huge access to justice issue, um, particularly around socioeconomic status. Um, I believe that everyone has the right to quality representation and I commit all of my time as an attorney currently to to achieving that goal to the best of my ability. In addition to the public defense work that I do, I have also um, volunteered many hours at different law day clinics in Skagit County, uh, the Latino Bar Association of Washington Free Legal Clinic, which was where we were specifically targeting Spanish speaking members of the community. Um, and again, just the work that I do as a bilingual attorney, I think is absolutely an access to justice issue where I can meet my clients somewhere in the middle, if not closer to where they are starting from. Our second question then will begin with candidate Hernandez. How would you describe the impact that a court of appeals judge has on the lives of citizens in your district? I think the court of appeals is an interesting position for the community to consider because most people don't have a lot of direct access to it. Typically by the time a case goes up to the court of appeals, um, the, the actual litigants or direct parties may not be involved in that process as far as the briefing or the oral arguments, they certainly may. But typically you will have the appellate attorneys present at, at any um, proceedings that would happen in Seattle. However, I think the role that the court of appeals plays in terms of upholding the rule of law in the state of Washington absolutely impacts every single one of us. Consistency in the application of the laws of the state of Washington creates stability for us as a community. Um, and so it may not be something that is a tangible impact in a day-to-day -day sense. Um, I absolutely think it is a critical one. And candidate Seguin. Uh, if you're a felon in Whatcom County, for example, and you're convicted of a crime, you have a right to appeal as a matter of right. Uh, even if you can't afford one. So from that standpoint, certainly, if you are uh, a felon, or I, on the other side of the coin, if you're a victim of crime, uh, you will have a very real interest in seeing that the prosecution is done correctly. And that sort of case goes down to the Court of Appeals, and they decide whether things are done correctly. Uh, the other thing is, if you have a civil dispute, and I have a number of these that I'm handling right now, where uh, what is done in the trial court, particularly the county court, uh, a result occurs which you do not like, you have a right to go to the Court of Appeals. And so in that uh, respect, it has a very real impact on every citizen who is in the court at any given point in time. Thank you. And now we'll start with Mr. Seguin. Many voters express confusion over how to choose a judicial candidate. Given your experience thus far with the election process and campaigning, how would you advise a voter to choose a judicial candidate in a race where you are not a candidate? Um, what qualities should voters uh, consider and what should voters be looking for as they choose somebody to, for any judicial spot? Um. When we talk about judges, we talk about judgment. That's a big word. And uh, when we talk about judgment, we talk about people who are uh, or have the ability to be fair and neutral. Detached is sometimes the word that is used when we describe magistrates. And there's a lot of case law out there that says that if a judge isn't that, then that in and of itself can be a, a basis for uh, 
taking a case away from a judge or reversing it. Um, I think all those qualities are important and I think they all stem from a person's life experiences and particularly for a judge, their legal life experiences. As I indicated in my opening statement, I have 30 years representing, by the way, uh, Ms. Hernandez talked about representing uh, people who are accused. I also have for the last uh, 10 years represented indigent defendants in Skagit County. Um, so I've been on both sides of the fence uh, as prosecutor, for example, in criminal cases and defense, and I have a good balance, which I would suggest to you is the type of quality that should be used in making that kind of a selection. And candidate Hernandez. Thank you. I would agree with Mr. Seguin that life experience is absolutely something that voters should consider. Um, I think when you are looking at a judicial candidate, um, it's important to look at the type of work that has been done, not only in the courtroom, but in the community as well. I think that um, we should look at the quality of the experience as well as the quantity or scope. Um, there are lots of different ways to measure that, but there are really unusual limitations on judicial candidates in terms of um, not being able to maybe weigh in um, on certain questions because of the code of judicial conduct. Um, so sometimes that can feel limiting for the public. But I think talking to people who know the candidates, talking with people within the legal community, opposing counsel, colleagues, other judicial officers, I think that's an excellent way to inquire into the quality of each candidate. Thank you. And this question will start with candidate Hernandez. Can you describe a circumstance where your personal beliefs conflicted with the law, and what was your response? What, what challenges, if any, did this create for you, and what was your response to those challenges? I absolutely encounter situations in my current work, um, but certainly also when I was practicing in immigration law where my personal beliefs um, might not have matched up with the current state of the law. Unfortunately, that's one of the challenges of being an attorney. Um, if you really want to do right by your client, sometimes that means giving them advice that might be hard to take. Um, it might be delivering bad news. Um, I may have to deliver that news several times a week, depending on the type of work that I'm doing. But the reality is I am a sworn officer of the court and integrity and, um, again, upholding the rule of law is absolutely essential from my perspective. Um, I'll just there. Candidate Seguin. There are circumstances in which I disagree with the law and there are cases I have been involved with where the application of that law, in my opinion, has rendered an injustice in a case, particularly according to my client. The appellate court happens to be one of the places where those types of things can be addressed. It is a court of correction in some senses, but it is also an appellate court. So if one wants to change the law, not through legislation, because the way the law has been applied is incorrect, one can go to the Court of Appeals and one can stand in front of those three judges or the Supreme Court, which I've done, and say, I believe the law is wrong and I believe it needs to change. And through the process of what we call stereotyping, decisis, the appellate court judges can change their view of the law and alter it. Now, there's ultimately always legislation that comes into play there, but uh, that is one of the measures that I have actually done over the course of my career handling appellate cases for 30 years. And this question will begin with candidate Seguin. In 2011, the Washington State Supreme Court created a task force called Race and the Criminal Justice System. The task force concluded that people of color face disparate impacts in every aspect of the justice system. What are your views on whether the courts as a whole deal effectively with racial bias, and what remedies have you considered to create systemic remedies for this problem? I have represented people of color throughout my career and people of different races. And I have seen firsthand circumstances where they don't get a fair shake. So in the first instance, in terms of representing people, I have advocated for them and, and asked that they be treated equally with other people who go through the system. And I won't go into the details there, but suffice it to say that has happened to me. So I believe it exists. 
Um, I believe that lawyers are in a unique, unique position to advocate for change there. Uh, going forward, I think as a court of appeals judge, uh, it is something that has to always be considered because there are circumstances when things happen and people don't really understand why, and I think it is a reality that in some of those circumstances, it happens because there are biases out there that affect the way people respond to whatever situation that they're in, whether it be a police officer or other parties. And candidate Hernandez. Thank you. As I indicated, I was an adjunct instructor at Western Washington University for a number of years. I taught American cultural studies, so I taught intersectional cultural topics. I'm well versed in the intersections of race, culture, sexuality, gender, socioeconomics, all the different factors that can come into play with regard to the findings of the Race, race and Criminal Justice Commission. That absolutely impacts the work that I do. It comes into play in terms of voir dire and jury selection uh, when we're talking about maybe racial differences with the accused, the victim, witnesses, what have you. Um, it absolutely comes into play in motions that I have written. I have taken it upon myself to educate judges and opposing counsel, including sometimes even assigning some reading, <laughs> um, to, to educate the people in the system um, so that we can be more responsive and more equal in our application of the laws. And this next question will begin with um, candidate um, Hernandez, and it's a two-part question. While serving on the bench, do you believe that you will have a role in bringing important legal or judicial issues before the public and or the legislature? Why or why not? But also, what changes, if any, to the judicial system would you advocate for and why? I don't know what sort of outreach I would be able to do with regard to the public or with regard to the legislature as a judicial officer. That would certainly be part of the learning process for me. Um, I have never been one before. Uh, that being said, as I indicated, community outreach, community service has been a huge part of my career up to this point. And so I can't imagine um, continuing in a way that that wasn't a part of it, even if that was just reaching out to students, for example, and talking about the legal system in general, and just doing community education about what the Court of Appeals does. That would absolutely be something that interests me, that I would want to pursue, but again, within the legal bounds of that code of judicial conduct. Um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> and candidate Seguin. I agree with uh, Ms. Hazel Hernandez that there are some limitations on the ability of a judge to uh, advocate, but certainly uh, I know for a fact that there are judicial organizations in Washington, um, the District Court Judges Association, the Superior Court Judges Association, um, and uh, I don't know if there's an appellate judge organization, I imagine there is, but um, they actively uh, lobby the legislature or participate in, le in making legislation, and I think that's a perfectly appropriate because they have a unique perspective. Um, in terms of what changes I would recommend to the system, it's a little bit of a tough question because I haven't been there either, but I guess what I have sort of learned in this campaign, I've been having some fun here, running around the four counties, talking to folks all over the place, and what I find is uh, that folks don't really believe that judicial candidates even come out and, and talk to people. And so I guess it would be my idea going forward um, to do that, to, to continue, maybe not to campaign, but to just be a presence in the community so that folks understand what the Court of Appeals does and uh, can better participate in that process. This next question will begin with candidate Seguin. What kind of work have you done outside of the judicial system to better understand our community, or I'll say in this case, our communities, because this is a multi-county uh, race? Well, uh, I have uh, been a resident of Skagit County since 1990. I worked here from 1997 to 2002. I was the assistant chief criminal deputy of the district court unit here, and uh, during that time I was responsible for participating 
uh, in an ancillary fashion, I guess I would say, with a lot of the community organizations that are affected by the criminal justice system here. And that, the thing that comes to mind most vividly to me is uh, participating in, in a lot of uh, domestic violence training, those sorts of things. I worked with a lot of community organizations over that time period. Uh, other than that, in my career at various times, I've been involved with other uh, in volunteer ba uh, capacities. I uh, was involved with the YMCA in Skagit County. I've been a big brother uh, long before in my career, and um, I guess that would cover it for the time being. And candidate Hernandez. Thank you. Um, as I indicated, I've got two kids. Uh, my older daughter graduated from Squalicum High School up here in Bellingham. My younger daughter is now at LaVenture Middle School in the dual language program in Mount Vernon. Um, they keep me busy. So I've been a parent volunteer for a very long time. I've done a lot of career days. Um, when I was working at Western, I also was involved in organizing the Migrant Youth Leadership Conference um, at Western that brings children coming from a migrant farm working experience to college campuses, um, trying to encourage them and their families to consider college as an option for them moving forward. I've presented at conferences uh, in within our district, but also um, elsewhere. Um, typically looking at access to higher education or presenting about uh, working in the law. I have recently joined the Skagit Island Community Partnership for Transition Solutions, which is a group of community stakeholders that looks at addressing recidivism um, by connecting recently incarcerated persons with education, housing, and employment. And we only have time for one more question. I'm so sorry. You both have been so interesting. But we'll start this one with candidate Hernandez. What type of experiences are important for the successful candidate to possess? And how do you think you would add to the mix of experience currently serving in Division I? I think that trial experience is absolutely essential for a Court of Appeals candidate. Your primary task is reviewing that record from the trial court. So someone who has that practical, tangible experience of what it means to be in a fast-paced trial with so many moving parts and being able to be nimble um, in terms of responding to whatever may be occurring. Um, I'm, I'm a trial attorney. I train younger attorneys in my office how to be trial attorneys. Um, so that's absolutely something I'm passionate about. I also think that um, having a grounding in public defense is, is a valuable asset. Uh, two of the judges who retired from Division I this year were the two judges of the 10 with public defense backgrounds. Um, and so again, I think that having this diversity of legal experience in these judicial panels is absolutely critical. And candidate Seguin. I agree with it, what she said. I've been a trial attorney for 30 years. I've handled aggravated murder cases. I've handled complex uh, financial fraud cases, one of which lasted a month and a half. Um, I have taken cases to the Court of Appeal, cases, multiple cases to the Courts of Appeal and the Supreme Court over that time period. I think appellate experience is very important to understand the inner workings. Uh, but I'm going to come back to my original comment, which maybe I'll come back to again, which is you should be looking for a balance a balance in a candidate. I have the experience that Ms. Hazelrig Hernandez just described as a public defender over the last 11 years. Prior to that, for 20 years, I worked as a prosecutor in Whatcom County, Skagit County, and San Juan County. Um, that gives me a, a unique perspective. I've also done civil cases over the last 10 or 11 years, including some complex civil litigation. Um, so I agree with everything she said. And um, I hope that you'll look for that balance. And now time for our one minute closing statements. And we'll start with candidate Seguin. Um, I kind of said what I want to say. So <laughs> uh, I mean, the key thing that I, I tell folks here is statistically, the Court of Appeals, half of the cases are criminal and half of them are civil. And you have the choice of a candidate, or you have in me a candidate who has the, the background, I mean, in the trenches, um, doing those types of cases over the last 30 years, which I think has prepared me extremely well to take on this position. I've also been, over that time period, working appellate cases. And what that means is that I have been writing appeals, and I have been arguing appeals before these courts. 
Um, so I know what the system looks like down there. I have the, the experience that is necessary to be a balanced candidate. And lastly, I guess to close it up, because we only get a minute, 15 seconds now, is that I have broad support, as I already indicated to you. And um, I feel very proud of the fact that in the primary, when uh, there were many votes cast, I won by 5,000 votes. So I believe, I, I truly say that I have broad support and I'm hoping that you will agree with me and vote for me when you get your ballots today or tomorrow. And candidate Hernandez. Thank you. Mr. Seguin is correct. Um, he won 27% of the vote in the primary. There were five of us. Um, and I think that quality of experience is absolutely important. Um, again, I think there are other measures beside mere quantity um, that the community should consider. And I think one of the ways that you do that is by looking at the judicial endorsements. Judge Becker, who has held this position for 24 years, vetted me by c communicating with opposing counsel, judges before whom I practice, and reviewing my writing samples before she rendered her endorsement of my candidacy. I'm extraordinarily honored to have her support as I seek to follow in her service to these four co counties. In addition to Judge Becker, I am endorsed by Susan Cook, David Sparr, and Laura Raquelme from the Skagit County Superior Court, Judge Garrett and Montoya Lewis from the Whatcom County Superior Court, Judge Loring from San Juan County, State Supreme Court Justice Stephen Gonzalez, and Cheryl Gordon McLeod. Thank you. And, and candidate Seguin, I did see that you held up the challenge card and unfortunately we're out of time. Those are for the question and answer portion, but I'd like to say thank you to both candidates for participating this evening. And on behalf of the voters who will be trying to make an informed decision, I thank you for the quality of information you've given to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, Jill, and thank you to the candidates. So while um, the next two candidates are getting settled, I will introduce the moderator. Our moderator for this debate will be Janet Ott, another longtime League member. And this debate will be between the candidates for the position of Whatcom County Prosecuting Attorney. I'll let Janet introduce the candidates and explain the procedures. Hi. Thanks, Janet. Sure. Thanks. Together, and it's an honor to moderate the debate for prosecuting <laughs> attorney in Whatcom County. So our second race of the evening is for candidates for Whatcom County prosecuting attorney, and there are two candidates on this ballot, candidates James Erb and Eric Ritchie. So I'm going to describe the office to you first. The county prosecuting attorney is the lawyer for the people of the county. The main responsibility of the prosecutor is to enforce criminal laws and work for the victims of crime. This includes ordering restitution for the victim and informing the victim of court dates and acting as an advocate for the victim at trial and sentencing. The prosecuting attorney also acts as legal counsel to the county, elected officials and county departments and assists in certain child support cases and performs a number of other duties. Deputy prosecutors are appointed by the prosecutor to help perform these duties. The prosecutor and the deputy prosecutors must be admitted to practice law in the state of Washington. To run for county prosecuting attorney, a lawyer must have practiced in the state of Washington for at least five years. The Whatcom County Prosecutor serves a four-year term, and current annual salary is $172,000.402. So we're going to follow the same rules that we used in the first race this evening, but I'll go over them again. By the end of the evening, you'll really know them. Um, candidates will have up to two minutes to ask each for an opening statement, and then they will have one minute to respond to each question, and we'll make a one-minute closing statement. Each candidate has a challenge card, right? Hold up your cards, guys. Thank you. Candidates may use this card to challenge or rebut their opponent's response. The challenging candidate will have 45 seconds to state the challenge, and his opponent will have 45 seconds to respond. Each candidate may use their challenge card one time during the question and answer period. And just hold up your card if you want to challenge someone. So we have our two timers again, Michelle and Carol. 
and they're going to be tracking the time. So this is for the two of you. So the timers will, fl they, they will hold up a yellow sign when six, 15 seconds remain and a red sign when your time is up. If you continue, a bell will be rung, and that means really just stop. Okay. We ask that the candidates be respectful of the time allotted due to the limited amount of time that we have and our desire to include as many questions as possible. Now, to the audience, again, a reminder that our goal in the League is civil discourse. To that end, we ask that those in the audience be respectful and refrain from comments, as well as hold your applause until the conclusion of each segment of the forum. We encourage you again to submit questions, written questions to the candidates. Um, any question you submit will be asked of both candidates, and ushers are available to pick up your questions. Just um, wave your question, and an usher will come get it. The questions will be screened by League members Judy and Heather, and they will be screening for legibility and clarity and to avoid duplication. So to begin, the candidates rolled the dice, and the high roller had the choice of going first with their opening statement or their closing statement. So I believe that, uh, Eric Ritchie, you will be going first with okay. your opening statement. So timers are ready. Um, so candidate Ritchie, please give your two-minute opening statement. Great, thank you. My name is Eric Ritchie. I'm really excited to be here. I get to tell you about myself and about the work that I've been doing. I'm currently working in the Whatcom County Prosecutor's Office, and that's just upstairs, right here. I've been in this office for 25 years. My boss is retiring, and I'm ready to take over. I'm currently the Chief Criminal Deputy, which means that I handle a lot of serious cases. I have three murder cases that are pending right now that are uh, set for trial. I, you probably have heard about one recently that happened over on the trail behind the Haskell Corporation. It's a very scary situation. It was a random act that uh, just sends chills throughout all of our community. I also supervise attorneys in my office. It's something that I've been doing for the last five years. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about some of my cases. I, I, uh, I made a career out of handling sexual assault cases. I stand or stood next to women and children uh, in the courtroom. And this is, uh, you know, they've been vulnerable people in terrible situations, and um, I've, I've done this for many years. Uh, I've started well before the Me Too movement ever began. This is uh, something that I believe in. I think that it's uh, important that we do so. I have never shied away from taking these kinds of cases, and these are difficult cases for prosecutors to handle. I want to tell you that. Um, Again, I've been in this office a long time. I'm excited about what's going to happen here with uh, the election and about change. I think it's important that we talk about you know, how we've done, because I think that our, my office has done very well working with serious cases. But we do need to make some changes. We need to treat people with addiction issues and mental health problems. They need treatment instead of incarceration. And I have many plans for that to be put in place. My, Thank you. Again, I'm excited about being here. Thank you. OK, candidate Herb, your two-minute opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is James Herb, and I hope to be the next Whatcom County prosecutor. I'm currently working as a senior assistant city attorney across the street at City Hall. I've been at the city for about eight years, since 2010. I've been an attorney for 14 years. I've worked as a prosecutor in three different jurisdictions. I have substantial criminal trial experience, and I've tried some pretty serious cases myself, including cases that are punishable by life in prison. I am, uh, I am married. My wife and I moved here back in 2007 from Florida, where we met as felony prosecutors in that office. And we have two young boys who were born here in Whatcom County. And we love it here in this community. We can't imagine living anywhere else. The reason why I'm running for this particular office is because we've been asked twice within the last three years to raise our taxes to build a bigger jail out in the county. And I simply don't think that that is the right solution for the problems facing our local criminal justice system. We know based on the data and the research that has been done that we have too many people in our jail today. We have six out of 10 people in the jail on any given day are there on a pretrial basis because they can't afford to pay bail 
because they have mental health issues that are not being adequately treated in our community, and because they have substance abuse issues and they are being treated like criminals rather than like people with a health problem. The approach to criminal justice in this county for many decades has failed to evolve, and that has led to over-incarceration here in Whatcom County, where even though we have one of the lower crime rates in the state, we incarcerate at a rate 16% higher than the Washington state average. That is largely due to the decisions and the policies and practices of the current leadership at the prosecutor's office. And as my opponent just pointed out during his opening statement, he has been part of that office for the past 25 years. I'm excited about the opportunity to bring real change to this office, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So you now have 60 seconds to respond to the questions. And the first question, which you'll be the first person to answer, Candidate Ritchie, is the prosecutor manages the largest law firm in Whatcom County. What do you think are the most relevant skills and talents you bring to this leadership aspect of the position? Candidate Ritchie. That's a great question. I really appreciate it. I'll tell you that um, I, I already work as a supervisor here in this office, and it's something that I've worked really hard to, to do it right. It's, it's uh, difficult making sure that people are motivated uh, to do the right thing, and, but it's something that we work for, uh, toward every day because being a prosecutor is one of the best, things, best jobs you can actually have, and that's because we get to look for justice in every decision that we make, and uh, that's where we, that's our focus. That's what we do every, every day. Um, it's also about relationships. Relationships are really important and knowing the people and getting along with the people and being able to work with them is so important. That's how, that's how management should work and that's how I've been running the office over the last five years. Hey, thank thank you. you. Candidate Herb. I've been working with the Human Resources Department for the last eight years at the city of Bellingham and working with managers uh, and department heads on managing their staff through some uh, interesting HR issues through the course of that time. So I'm familiar with uh, management styles, different management styles, and what I've learned throughout the course of my experience at the city is that one of the best things that managers can do with their staff is to communicate with them and provide them the resources that they need to do their jobs well. And I'm particularly interested in providing additional resources and professional staff development to the attorneys in the prosecutor's office and the staff there uh, to make sure that we can minimize some of the mistakes that we've seen over the past few years uh, and move the office into a better direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Second question, Candidate Erb. The, the Whatcom County residents have twice rejected attacks to construct a new jail. As prosecutor, what do you believe is the best approach to addressing issues with the current jail? That's a terrific question. I think it's important to note that the county council has already earmarked several million dollars in repair money for the existing facility here uh, downtown. And so we need to make sure that that work can be done so that the jail can be a safe place for the people who work there and the people that are housed there. I think one of the prosecutor's most fundamental responsibilities is gonna be determining who is in the jail because the prosecutor makes the decision of who is going to be charged with a crime, whether you'll be charged with a felony or a misdemeanor, what the bail recommendation is going to be, whether the person will be recommended for pretrial release, what kind of alternatives uh, for pretrial release, release will be available to an, each individual person. At the city of Bellingham over the last couple of years, we've expanded the use of electronic home monitoring rather than pretrial incarceration. We have saved over a million dollars in one year and allowed people to remain connected to their jobs, to their families, to their housing, et cetera. And so bringing some of this forward thinking approach from the city over to the county is something that I'm excited about. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ritchie. So thank you for the question. The jail is an interesting issue. Uh, of course, the, uh, the community has rejected the tax twice. And the, uh, the county council has been working on this issue. They've been working on having a jail tour. And it's been fascinating watching that program work. They've been working to develop some, some support for probably, probably replacing the jail. I guess we'll see exactly how that goes. But it, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. I support uh, the idea of having a humane facility for our inmates, a humane uh, facility for those who work there. I think that the, uh, the jail is currently in, in disrepair, and I know that they're, 
there's been some money that's been put forward to, to repair it. I'm not sure how, how, uh, how much that's going to actually uh, fix this jail. I heard uh, my opponent talk a little bit about bail, and that's going to be an interesting issue as well. I believe that we only should be holding people who are dangerous and people who are at absolute flight risk, and otherwise bail should not be imposed. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. So the criminal side of the prosecutor's office deals with crime, and the civil side deals with civil issues, a few of which are land use, water, contracting governments, tax assessment, and collection. During the effort to bring a coal port to Cherry Point, the county council refused to hear comments from constituents based on legal advice from the civil division of the prosecutor's office. Do you concur with that legal advice? Why or why not, uh, Candidate Ritchie? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> so the civil department was involved in that, and this is an interesting uh, position that the county council put themselves in. They were acting as a quasi-judicial uh, office. They were working as uh, someone who was to decide a decision, an appeal from the uh, appeal from the board um, below them, and they cannot take information from parties without having the other side there. That's, that's important. It otherwise would uh, muddle up the system. So in acting in that quasi-judicial role, they, had a, they were put themselves in a difficult spot. I believe that the uh, county council would have been better served if they acted more as legislators and listened to the constituents the way that they normally would. I, um, I know that there was probably some middle ground for the county council to take there, but in that situation, that's what they did. I think from, for, from this point going forward, they should probably stick to their role. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Herb. Yes, I, I think my opponent is mistaken. He's referring to the ex parte doctrine that wouldn't allow the county council to hear from one party on this particular issue, but I think what he means to say is that under the appearance of fairness doctrine, the county council was not able to accept public comment on that issue uh, while the permit was still pending and before a decision had been made because the council was sitting in their appellate capacity. And I do think that that was the appropriate advice given that circumstance. However, it is also my understanding that since uh, the coal port terminal was defeated that the county council has changed uh, the procedures to remove themselves from the appellate uh, decision-making authority there so that if the, a similar issue were to come to pass, that advice would no longer be valid and the council would be able to accept public comment, which would be the advice I would give them. Okay, thank you. Next question. With 95% of criminal cases ending in plea bargaining, how concerned are you that innocent people may be pleading guilty and plea bargaining to avoid greater sentences? Candidate Erb. I'm very concerned about that. I think that this is a problem not just in Whatcom County, but across the United States of America. Um, nationally speaking, over 90% of criminal cases are resolved by plea bargains, and this problem is exacerbated when you have a prosecutor's office that piles on charges. So when you have a prosecutor's office that makes decisions to throw the book at somebody whenever they come into the criminal justice system, then that's the starting point for any further plea negotiations that would result in a, a more favorable plea agreement. And so that's a problem. You need to make sure that you have a prosecuting attorney who's going to exercise his or her discretion at the front end when they're making a charging decision so that uh, the, um, the plea that is negotiated is not coerced out of a defendant that is um, afraid to take their chances in criminal court or in a trial setting because if they lose, the stakes are that much higher. Okay, thank you. Candidate Ritchie. I have some concerns about this too. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, in, the, in the beginning there is a check and balance that when, when a case is charged, probable cause has to be found by a court of law. So a judge reviews all the probable cause charging that, that the prosecutor does just to make sure that everything, uh, everything fits. But I do have concerns about piling on charges. I, you know, I mean, you can't pile on charges that don't have a probable cause for, but it's, it's something that, um, it's something that it's something that we, uh, we watch very carefully. We make sure that we're not being coercive. And I'll tell you that in my tenure as the chief criminal deputy, we have uh, we decided to dismiss bail jump charges when people have failed to appear and then appear within 30 days. And that's just to be fair, because we, because we could be charging bail jump charges uh, when people have failed to appear for court. 
now we're, uh, we're not because we don't want to be coercive. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator, um, Senator, Candidate Herb, you've <laughs> raised your challenge card, so you have 45 seconds to state your challenge. Yes, I do want to respond briefly to the idea that the current prosecutor's office is not piling on charges. A good example of this is residue cases. Right now, if you are a drug addict and you are caught here in Whatcom County with paraphernalia that contains drug residue, you will be charged by the Whatcom County prosecutor's office with a felony. There is no greater example that I can think of of prosecutorial overreach than charging people with amounts as small as one one hundredth of a gram of a controlled substance with a felony rather than exercising your prosecutorial discretion to treat those people as if they have a health problem, like they do. Okay, so Candidate Ritchie, you have 45 seconds if you want to respond to his uh, response. I do, thank you. Okay. So yes, currently that is the practice to charge residue cases. Residue means that there's an amount that can be tested by the crime lab to show that, these, that there is a drug in, uh, that the person is possessing. And that happens throughout the state of Washington. Not everywhere, but throughout the state of Washington it happens because it's also, I mean, that's the law. Now, is that fair? That's something that we're going to be talking about. I, uh, I have to tell you that I have concerns about charging residue cases. There are some times when I think that it's important that we, uh, that we handle these types of cases to make sure that people get treatment. But most of the time, I don't believe that we should be charging residue cases. And that's something that will be changed going forward when I'm elected. Thank you. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Do you support I-1639 regarding changes to gun ownership and purchase requirements? Why or why not? Candidate Ritchie. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. So this is something that's asking my opinion about, about the law, and because this is not something that the prosecutor really has a huge impact with, except except in so far as how it's prosecuted later, because there are some charges that are involved with this, this uh, new initiative. So the new initiative makes, makes it a crime to store a firearm improperly. And uh, frankly, this, this uh, statute has some built, a lot of built-in discretion for the prosecutor's office, which gives me some pause and some concern. Am I going to vote for it? Yes, I am. I am going to vote for it because I believe that this new initiative will save lives. And that's why I'm going to vote for it. But I do have concerns. I'll be honest about it. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Erb. Yes, 100% I support Initiative 1639. This is exactly the type of common sense gun safety legislation that we should all support. I respectfully disagree with my opponent that the prosecutor's office doesn't have any role to play here because this initiative is intended to promote safe schools and safe communities. And I've heard my opponent say time and time again that the paramount responsibility of the county prosecutor is public safety. So I think that it is absolutely appropriate for the county prosecutor to take a strong position on this bill. Prosecutors across the country are banding together uh, to form prosecutors against gun violence, uh, to advocate for common sense solutions like 1639. I'm proud to be endorsed by the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which is promoting this initiative, because I think it is incredibly important as the father of two young school aged children. Safe schools are important to me, and I think our community deserves a place where our kids can go to a safe school, and our community deserves a place that is safe. Hey, thank you. Candidate, uh, next question, Candidate Herb. What is your opinion on prosecuting protesters who were expressing their First Amendment rights to protest on the freeway? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the First Amendment right to freedom of speech is of paramount importance, particularly at this particular moment in our country's history. And I don't think that anyone is best served by bringing a heavy-handed approach to the prosecution of people who are peaceably assembled to protest issues that they have a legitimate grievance with. And it doesn't matter to me in what location that person is. The First Amendment is sacrosanct. And I won't be exercising or over-exercising my prosecutorial authority to do things like work with Jeff Sessions in the Department of Justice to see confidential records uh, that are held by third parties so that I could go after people a year after the fact. And I'm certainly not going to be supporting bills like Senator Erickson sponsored that would further criminalize peaceful protest in our community because I think that that is a terrible idea. People have the right to freedom of expression. I will honor that right and I will not criminalize people for engaging in their First Amendment rights. Thank you. Candidate Ritchie. 
<clears throat> Thank you, that's a great question. So I also support the First Amendment. I think it's very important to be able to express yourself. I have protested many times myself. I think that we all uh, need to be able to express ourselves when we disagree with what's going on. Now, uh, as far as what happened with this, uh, this freeway uh, incident, this is a pending matter, and I have some concerns about, about uh, speaking about this individual case, about uh, search warrants and things like that. I think that's improper to be doing so, as uh, even as someone who's a candidate for a prosecutor. But I will tell you that I have, uh, I do know about the, some things about the case uh, that we all know, and that is that it happened on the freeway, and there are dangers that occur when people block the freeway. In fact, in this particular incident, a car uh, crashed, and uh, I understand that people were injured. So I think that those are things that we need to protect the community for and make sure that those kinds of, those kinds of actions don't happen. Now, whether it's heavy-handed or not, that's something that we need to be very careful about because we should not be heavy-handed handling those things. Okay, thank you. Next question, Candidate Ritchie. What is the role of the prosecuting attorney in educating law enforcement to ensure they follow the rule of law and respect the constitutional rights of all individuals? Role of the prosecutor in uh, in in training the uh, local law enforcement officers is uh, something that we do. We've been doing that for a long time. I personally have done so. I've trained officers in, in issues of sexual assault investigations. I've trained SANE nurses in issues of sexual assault investigations. These are things that we've been doing for a long time. Our role is it's important that we make sure that law enforcement officers know what's legally right and what's legally wrong. And that includes investigations to protect civil rights. Uh, we've been doing that as, as Whatcom County prosecutors and we will continue to do that under my tenure. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Erb. Yeah, the county prosecutor is the attorney for the Whatcom County Sheriff and therefore for all the deputies that serve under him. Um, and is also has to work closely with the chiefs of police and law enforcement throughout our community. And I think it is important to have a respectful and a productive working relationship with those parties to make sure that you can train them on important issues around constitutional rights to make sure that they're not infringing on those rights by doing things like working with Jeff Sessions in the Department of Justice to get search warrants for Facebook or you know, otherwise uh, invading people's Fourth Amendment rights to be free from unreasonable search and seizure or invading people's rights to be free from the right of self-incrimination and things of that nature. It is important that the prosecuting attorney acts as a check on the authority of law enforcement and holds law enforcement accountable when they're violating people's constitutional rights. And one of the ways that prosecutors can do that is not continuing to prosecute cases when there are violations or uh, provable violations of a person's constitutional rights. Hey, thank you. So that was the last question. So now you will each have an opportunity to make a one-minute closing statement, and we'll start with candidate Herb. Actually, I think I'm going last because of the dice roll. Oh, that's roll. right. You're going last. We'll start with candidate Ritchie. Again, I want to thank you all for having me here. I am excited about this process. I'm excited about my campaign. I received broad support in the primary. In fact, I handily won the campaign in the primary. I, I think that uh, I, the reason that happened is because I do have broad support. It's This should not be a partisan race, and I had support from both the Republicans and the Democrats. I had Democratic support from the past uh, leaders of the Wacom Democrats that be Bill Gorman, um, Mike Estes, and, um, and Barry Buchanan. And of course, I'm receiving Republican support from important people like Bill Elfo, and of course, my boss, Dave McEachern. This is, uh, th this is a real exciting time for me. I, uh, I briefly want to say that I'm, uh, I've been attacked by my opponent for my appellate record, and I I'm proud of the work that I've done, standing up next to victims, and I will continue to do so in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Herb. Thank you. Um, the choice before the voters on November 6th is clear. We can continue the same policies and practices that have been placed in the prosecutor's office for many years. Um, we can elevate a person who has worked in the office for 25 years and does not have a history of bringing about much positive change there. Or we can elect a new prosecutor like me who is an outsider to the office with a fresh 
perspective and a modern approach to criminal justice. While I have not worked in the Whatcom County Prosecutor's Office, I have worked in three separate prosecutor's offices. I have seen three different approaches to criminal justice. I have not been trained in the approach of Mr. McEachern, and I have not been selected by him, hand selected, to take over and continue on with the policies and practices of that office after he retires here. Uh, this is a partisan race, and I am endorsed by every Democratic organization here in Whatcom County by the Alliance I mentioned earlier, Equal Rights Washington, the Northwest Washington Central Labor Council, the Lummi Nation, and over 500 individuals in our community who are passionate about change. And I hope to add your names on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both for your participation tonight, and most importantly, for your willingness to run for this important office. Thank you. <laughs> So while the next set of candidates are coming to the podium, I'll introduce that briefly. So this debate will be between the candidates for Public Utility District Number 1, the Commissioner for District Number 1, and Janet Ott will again moderate for us. And Janet will introduce the candidates and just briefly recap the rules of the debate. Thank you, Janet. You might give people a minute or two to settle down. Okay, thank you, Heather. Again, it's my privilege to moderate uh, the next section for candidates for public utility district one commissioner. And there are two candidates on this ballot for this race, candidates Atola Dishmani and Paul Kenner. I'm gonna describe the office first. Public Utility District Number 1 is governed by a board of commissioners comprised of three local citizens elected on a nonpartisan basis by Whatcom County residents. The commission establishes PUD policies, sets rates, adopts system plans for electric and water utilities, and approves the revenue obligations. In addition to guiding PUD operations, the commissioners appoint the general manager. A PUD commissioner is elected every two years during the general election to serve a six-year term. The annual, the annual salary is $30,804. So we're going to follow the same rules used in the other races this evening, and both candidates have said they are familiar with the rules. So we are just going to start. As soon as I'm ready. So uh, in the dice rolling, it looks like um, the person who is going to make the two-minute opening statement is Paul Kenner, correct? Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Paul Kenner. I'd like to first of all thank the League of Women Voters for putting this forum on tonight. Um, as you heard, uh, I'm running for PUD District Number 1, Position Number 2, District Number 2. And uh, I am one of three individuals who oversee a $21 million public utility district. Most of that revenue comes from Cherry Point. We deliver water to all the industries of Cherry Point, and we deliver electricity to Phillips 66 Refinery. But we're involved in a lot more things besides Cherry Point. We're involved with the ag community, trying to help them with their water issues, water supply, water rights. We're very involved with water associations, helping cure their problems of nitrates and other issues that they're faced with. We are kind of a poster child for the Department of Health, in fact, on uh, our model of working with water districts. Um, in addition to that, um, we, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you about myself since I only have two minutes. Um, I'm married, I have four children. Uh, I, my full-time job is that of owning and operating for years, many years, Snapper Schuler Kenner Insurance. I still work there. And uh, I've been involved in a number of uh, civic boards. I've been president of the Linden Chamber of Commerce. I've been president of the Whatcom uh, County YMCA. I was president of the board of the Whatcom uh, Community College Trustees. And um, I uh, also served in the US Coast Guard. I believe that the uh, PUD has a unique um, challenge facing us, a positive challenge that I think we can be able to use our water rights, our vast water rights that we have, 
and really uh, solve some of the upcoming, the current problems we have in our water supply and water quality in Whatcom County. And I look forward to uh, being your commissioner for the next six years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dishmani, your two minute opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. What a great tradition the League of Women Voters has, and it's just a real privilege to participate in that as a candidate. My name is Atul Dashmane. I've been living in Whatcom County since 2002. I raised my children here. I love to live here. I've been, uh, had the fortune of serving this community already in multiple capacities. I have been on the board of two nonprofits in this community. I've been on the Whatcom County Planning Commission for the last couple of years. And uh, I've also started and uh, successfully run a business uh, that in, from which I started in 2006 in the renewables. And uh, I have now about 25 years of experience in clean technology and infrastructure. And I'm uh, very excited to take my technical background as well as involvement in the community to the next level. For me, the PUD would be the perfect opportunity to do that. I'm delighted for the opportunity to participate in this debate. My priorities are renewable energy, broadband, particularly fiber optic, and water conservation. And I think I'd like look forward to discussing how I can carry out those priorities at the PUD. Thank you. Thank you. First question. How do you differentiate yourself from your opponent? Mr. Dishmani. We, I, there's a few things uh, that are important here. The PUD is an infrastructure organization. And as an infrastructure organization, there's many engineering related uh, challenges and technical challenges. Uh, I'm a uh, electrical engineer uh, and uh, I have had the opportunity to work on infrastructure throughout my career. Uh, one example is I worked on the largest renewable natural gas infrastructure project in the country. It was done here in King County, which working with Puget Sound Energy was able to provide renewable natural gas to uh, fleets in Washington State as well as in other states as well. So that's one example of how I would differentiate myself as uh, the areas of technical background that I have and applying them in, in important uh, systems and policies. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kenner. Well, first of all, I would say that uh, my 30 plus years of experience on the PUD, uh, I've gained knowledge and expertise that um, anybody walking into this could not possibly match. Um, I also degree, believe that my education uh, is a better fit for this particular role of overseeing the PUD, overseeing a multi-million dollar budget. Uh, we hire consultants, we hire engineers. Uh, you don't need to be one to oversee a PUD uh, like Whatcom. Um, I've had a solid history in Whatcom County of public service uh, for 44 years. Um, I have got a solid business background, and I believe it better suits the role of uh, a PUD commissioner overseeing this, this entity. Okay, thank you. Question number two, what is your top priority should you be elected? Um, Mr. Kenner. My opponent has spent a lot of time talking about alternative energy and broadband, and those are important. But they pale in comparison, in my opinion, to the water issues that we're faced with in Whatcom County. My uh, priority in the next few years would be to use our 53 million gallon water right per day to help solve some of these water supply issues. The Nooksack River today was within a few inches of its all-time low for this date in history. And uh, we need to be prepared for what's, for what's coming. And we need to solve the issues of water supply in Whatcom County. Okay, thank you. Candidate Dishmani. I chose not to challenge Paul in his response previously, but I, I'll clarify that a water crisis needs innovation. Making renewable energy work needs innovation. And you can't hire consultants to innovate. You need people who are able to lead you into innovation. And that's really an important clarification. So, for example, I've had the opportunity to study 
the last five years of PAD minutes. I have a database. And in that database, renewable energy is brought up approximately 10 times in one capacity or another. And in every time that that's been brought up, whether it's been wind or solar, others not so much, or whether it's been wind or solar, it's been brought up in a negative light. So I think we need some leadership at the PUD to be able to actually make things happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, candidate Kenner, you have, you have 45 seconds to state your challenge. I've had uh, 38 years of attending PUD meetings. He's been to one for five minutes. Um, I would have to say that uh, alternative energy has been brought up way more than 10 times. We are uh, working on um, alternative energy right now that includes a possibility of a solar farm, and studying whether that's a possibility in Cherry Point along with the Port of Bellingham. We're working with the digesters and farms in Linden, uh, trying to refine the methane uh, and uh, end up with a uh, alternative natural gas. So we've been involved in alternative energy. Um, he just hasn't been there to hear about it. Okay, thank you. Um, Candidate Dishmani, you have 45 seconds if you choose to, to respond yeah, to, to his challenge. Okay. I'd love to. Uh, so, for sure, we, we've hired consultants to study stuff. I'm, I'm not denying that, Paul. I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing that there's been a lot of uh, consultants hired. I think we need to do something. And to do something means to not do studies. And there's, uh, in my professional experience, I've mitigated millions of tons of carbon. As a matter of fact, that particular project that I was referring to in Cedar Hills is mitigating about a million pounds of carbon every day. Okay, thank you. Third question. Um, given that the PUD is one of the largest senior water rights holders in our county, what role do you think the PUD should play in helping to restore stream flows for salmon and ensure water for farms and households? Candidate Dishmani. I thought I was going to pop. Would you repeat the question again, please? Thanks. Repeat the question? Yes. <clears throat> Given that the PUD is one of the largest senior water rights holders in our county, what role do you think the PUD should play in helping to restore stream flows for salmon and ensure water for farms and households? Okay. So, yes, the PUD, um, like the city of Bellingham, has a similar uh, uh, priority. And in Western water law, it's all about the priority in the order of precedent. Of course, the uh, First Nations or Native communities have senior water rights to the PUD as well. From my understanding, study of water-related issues, the greatest concerns about water access are upstream. The PUD's extraction points are downstream. So there's great potential for the PUD to work with people that need water to help alleviate upstream demands and assist. Uh, the general manager has done an excellent presentation, which I've posted on my website, uh, relating to how the PUD can work with other water needs to help facilitate those needs. So, thank you. Thank you. Candidate Kenner. We have probably been the lead agency in Whatcom County over the years uh, in water issues, water supply issues. We're working on a number of projects right now. We've got a very large dairy in Acme called Coldstream, where a company called Regenis is putting in a nano filtration system in their dairy, where they're going to run 22,000 gallons of manure through this filtration system, and it produces 12,000 gallons of clean water. That's enough water to offset and mitigate all the wells that would be off done in the Acme area. Uh, we are working on a study for off-river off storage uh, to augment the, um, the farm community in er times of drought. We are just, con just finishing a drought contingency plan that will uh, be out shortly. Uh, trying to help again the farmers and uh, the issues they deal with. We got lots more projects we're doing, uh, but my time is up. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Question number four. 
What do you think have been the three most important contributions of the PUD to the economic and environmental health of Whatcom County in the past six years? Candidate Kenner. Uh, you know, we provide utilities, and they're reasonably low-cost utilities to Cherry Point. So I think we're a major partner in the success of the industries at Cherry Point, therefore the jobs of Cherry Point. Um, I think we've done a great job of dealing with uh, water issues with the tribe, with uh, farmers. I think we're instrumental in, in, in uh, water associations. Uh, we've kept several of them uh, open through E. coli situations. We have uh, had several join other associations and made all that happen through grants from the Department of Health, and we've, they've alleviated their nitrate systems that uh, they basically, uh, Covenant Christian School would have been closed down right now if we didn't help them get on a different water association. Hey, thank you. Candidate Dishmani. So in the uh, last six years, I think there's a lot to compliment uh, the PUD's general manager, Steve Jilk, particularly as it relates to the water issues that Paul talked about. The PUD has opportunities in the next six years to focus on the other two areas that I'm focusing on, renewable energy and broadband. And to do that, we're going to need new leadership. Uh, question number five. How are the regional impacts of climate change likely to affect the PUD's planning for water and energy in the medium to longer term? And what policies would you recommend to address these impacts? Candidate Dishmani. So climate change is a, a helpful question because there's two aspects that have to be dealt with with climate change. One is mitigation and the other is adaptation. There are already things in progress uh, th as a result of things we've done in the past uh, relating to water scarcity, climate, that we have to be able to adapt to. The, one of the most important places where that is showing up is water, how we manage and conserve water. So we have to develop more, a more intense collaboration with industry in this regard. For example, in Whatcom County, 99.3% of the water that's consumed is not residential. So if we want to make a difference, we have to work with industry more closely in order to manage consumption, use of water in a manner that is adapting. Thank you. Kenneth Kenner. In the last five years, we've worked with industries at Cherry Point, and Intalco is a perfect example. We encourage them, along with BP's help, to uh, put a mechanical cooling device in their system. They went from five million gallons a day to one and a half. And uh, other industries have had not quite that good of results, but good conservation. Uh, our only electric customer, Phillips 66, has gone from, um, I don't know what the percentage of increase, but they've greatly increased their production and they've not increased their, their usage of electricity. So they've been good stewards of our resources as well. We are very attuned to changes in the river that we see coming, that have seen. We are uh, engineering our, our plants to be able to cope with different uh, river uh, levels. We are also working, as I said, with off-site storage that could be used for drought, uh, drought times for the farmers. And that's even a possibility, a little far-fetched, but even could be used if it was big enough for piping uh, during flood times to fill this reservoir. Okay, thank you. Question number six. Uh, what do you think have been the three biggest missed opportunities of the PUD in recent years? Candidate Kenner. I don't think we've missed anything. <laughs> I think with our staff of 21 people, um, a, a, a general manager that that's probably my best accomplishment was finding him. Um, I, th I think that our staff has really covered the issues that we needed to cover. I'm very proud of their, their, issue, their handling of the water issues and their involvement with the tribes and various other stakeholders. So 
you know, alternative energy that we keep talking about, and I hate to keep harping on this, but we don't have any distribution system in Whatcom County. Puget Energy does, and I should add that Puget Energy is gradually going to more and more alternative energy. They're gradually backing off of coal, and in five years, they will be 23% uh, alternative energy, wind and solar. Bonneville, where we buy our power, is, of course, hydro. That's kind of the ultimate renewable energy. So I'm sure my opponent will find something we've missed in the last three years, but I don't know what it is. Okay, thank you. Candidate Dishmani. Well, it's, it's not like it's a picking a needle in a haystack. I, it's, it's a large opportunity. Uh, we can talk about uh, sitting on our hands or sitting on our laurels and letting the current inertia move in the direction that it's going to move us at whatever rate it moves us. But that's really not our option today. Our option is to be way more proactive than we have been. And so the first piece of that would be to develop renewable energy to its fullest potential in this county. And developing it to its fullest potential means that we need to see a lot more community solar. People are putting solar on their houses right now. I've got solar in my barn. But the thing is that getting broader adoption means that we have to pool energy, pool resources, work with the port, work with other agencies to make things happen. And there's a difference between taking credit for what staff has been doing and actually leading staff. Now, I plan to lead staff. Okay, thank you. So this is the last question. And I believe, this is question seven, and I believe we'll start with candidate Deshmani. What should the voter know about the PUD's most important functions that you think they don't know? Well, the voters should know that the PUD is not just constrained to serving the three refineries in Ferndale and the Grandview Business Park. The Whatcom County PUD is the Whatcom County PUD. It has the potential of serving the entire county. There's countless people in our county who don't have broadband, and those people need to be served. Now, we can say, well, it doesn't work, we can't figure out how to do it, or we can be more proactive. There are 29 PUDs, 28 which belong to the Association of PUDs. Of those, 14 have implemented broadband. Now, I think Whatcom County is smarter than those other counties. And I think we can make stuff happen too. So it's a missed opportunity and an area which I plan to focus on. Thank you. Candidate Kenner. I don't think that the vast majority of Whatcom County citizens really follow the PUD, and I, it's probably kind of boring and I understand that. But I, I, what they probably don't realize is that we have the same um, taxing authority that the port has and uh, it would be substantial if we ever used it. We have never used our taxing authority. We rebuilt our plant for millions and millions of dollars in the last three years, and didn't do a single bit of it with taxpayer money. Uh, we do all these things for water associations and, other, and, and the farmers, never getting any tax money. I think that's a main factor they don't know. Now, could we use our tax authority someday? Sure. If we did a major project that included the whole county, um, I could see a need maybe to use some taxing authority. We're kind of proud that over all these years, we, we haven't had to use it. As for broadband, uh, we are actually working on a project with, uh, considering a project with broadband. The Port of Bellingham has recently uh, received authorization to get into broadband, and they are probably going to ask us to be involved with them. Candidate Dishmani, did you want to challenge? Yes, I did, Paul. You have 45 <laughs> seconds. Oh, he already did. No, I, I didn't challenge yet. Oh, okay. I was just once. Is this your second challenge? No, it's my first challenge, isn't it, Paul? I made a challenge. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Candidate Dishmani. My challenge with, with Paul's support, I can make it way more interesting. <laughs> and with all of your support as well. That's my challenge. Okay, <laughs> Candidate Kenner, if you choose, you may respond to that challenge. You know, I commend the tool to to step into this arena and, uh, and, and challenge a guy with 38 years experience. I, I commend him for being uh, involved in politics and be willing to serve, so there you go. Okay, thank you. It is now time for your uh, closing statement and we'll start with candidate Dishmani. Actually, I think I'm going last. 
Oh, that's right, you're last, sorry. Yes, we'll start with candidate Kenner, correct. Uh, thank you again for coming here tonight, and uh, I know the PUD is probably not the most exciting election out there, and uh, we'll try to make it more exciting, right? Um, I, um, I just to say that I'm proud that I've served the PUD for 38 years. I know that seems like a long, long time, but I started when I was 15. And uh, <laughs> I'm, pr I'm, proud of the, I'm proud of the accomplishments that we've done. Um, I'm proud of our staff, and, and I'm proud that we haven't used any taxes. I'm very happy that I'm supported by uh, County Executive Jack Louse. I am supported by six of the seven mayors. And I think the PUD's got a great opportunity to really solve in the next six years some water quality issues, water supply issues, and uh, I hope you'll allow me to be in that position for the next six years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, candidate Dishmani. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. I agree with Paul that uh, there's a real wonderful opportunity to deal with water issues. I think it's a, uh, the general manager has really excelled in that area in particular. Uh, I have also a focus on renewable energy. And Washington Conservation Voters has endorsed me because of my lifelong dedication to renewable energy. In addition to that, I have endorsements from the Whatcom County Council. Satpal Sudhu is here. Thank you, Satpal. Michael Oliquez from the City Council and Michael Shepard from the Port of Bellingham. And I also was put on the Planning Commission by Jack Laws, so he can't think I'm a bad guy. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about being able to lead, but also support. And that's something I also want to clarify. Someone with my background can also support staff. So I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both for your participation tonight, and thank you again for running for this important office. Thank you to our candidates. So the last debate of the evening is for the Whatcom County Council at large position B. Now, Jill Bernstein will again be our moderator for this session, and she will explain how the session will run, because it'll be slightly different to what you've seen in previous sessions. It is my pleasure, and thank you, Heather, and good evening, everyone. Our final race of the evening is intended for the candidates for the Whatcom County Council at Large Position B. And in fact, in the race, there are two candidates on the ballot. Uh, one is candidate Carol Frazee, and the other is candidate Mike Patum. And unfortunately, and to our disappointment, Mr. Patum could not be with us this evening. Apparently, he had a scheduling conflict, and he sent his wife, Christy Patum here to uh, be in his stead. And the league, as you've seen tonight, goes out of their way to try to figure out ways to be even-handed and neutral as we provide this important information to voters. And so what we're going to do is to give uh, Christy Patum an opportunity to make an opening statement on behalf of her husband, Mike. And uh, that will be followed with Carol Frazee making an open, opening statement for two minutes. But then Mrs. Patum will be leaving um, the stage and questions will be addressed only to Carol Frazee and we will have approximately 15 minutes for questions. Now as you think about the office of the county council, you should know that the county council exercises its legislative power by adoption and enactment of ordinances and resolutions. The council is elected to adopt plans for the present and future development of the county conduct public hearings on matters of public concern, create county government policy, create land use rules, enact public safety laws, establish the compensation for all county officers and employees, and provide for the reimbursement of expenses, establish, combine, and abolish non-elective administrative offices and executive departments, and establish their powers and responsibilities, except as otherwise provided for in the Whatcom County Home Rule Charter. They are also to levy taxes, appropriate revenue, and adopt the county budget. They set speed limits. Um, and no shooting zones and animal control regulations. So their, their responsibilities are quite broad. 
Our county council consists of seven members who serve four-year terms and their current annual salary is $31,867 each of those years. So as I mentioned, we're going to be handling this just a little bit differently. We're going to start with Christy Patum making a two-minute opening statement on behalf of candidate Mike Patum, followed by Carol Frazee making a two-minute opening statement. Christy Patum will then leave the stage and questions will go directly to Carol Frazee for about 15 minutes. So thank you all. Hold your applause, hold your comments until the end, but do send your questions forward. And thank you. So, oh, Christy Patum, please start. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here on the behalf of my husband, Mike. Uh, Mike and I own two businesses in Whatcom County. Mike loves to serve the community. He's currently a volunteer firefighter and a director on the Birch Bay Chamber of Commerce. We both grew up here. We are raising our kids here. Uh, but Mike is concerned about the future of Whatcom County, and he wants to serve so that he can better all of us or all of our opportunities here in Whatcom County. He plans to do that in three ways. First, by encouraging an atmosphere of neighbors helping neighbors. He wants to help those in need uh, not just live here, but to really thrive. And he wants to help organizations that are already working towards these goals because when each member of our community is successful, then you know, it's going to decrease homelessness, increase mental health, and increase each individual's ability to be economically stable. Secondly, uh, Mike wants to strengthen our economy. He supports local businesses and farmers, and it's important to him to try to find a balance between regulations that are necessary to uh, protect our environment while also making sure that we're not, you know, we're not over-regulating, and so it's hurting our economy and our businesses. And then thirdly, Mike wants to focus on give, uh, bringing local solutions to uh, Whatcom County issues. So empowering uh, each community to have a say in what they feel is best for them. And uh, he, I'm sorry, he also wants to take a strong look at our how we're spending our tax dollars and make sure that each community can have the opportunity to spend the money the way that they would like to. Mike uh, is strong in problem solving and we hope that you have, he has your support. Thank you. And candidate Frazee. Thank you and thanks for everyone who stuck around for the last show. <laughs> My name is Carol Frazee. I am running for Whatcom County Council at large. I am a small business owner. I have a business fit school where we empower individuals through walking and running programs here in Whatcom County and also online. I'm a former middle school teacher. I'm the mother of two teenagers and the wife of a Whatcom Community College instructor. And my husband Paul and I, we moved here 20, or 18 years ago. We've been married 25 years, but we moved here 18 years ago and we feel like that's one of the best decisions we've ever made. And so um, my, our focus for the campaign and for the Whatcom County is on a healthy Whatcom County. Healthy making policies, creating policies, and also supporting the services for health. Individual health, environmental health, and economic health. So for individuals, that's taking people from where they are mentally and physically and helping them thrive. For environmental health, we need to preserve the natural beauty and the natural resources of Whatcom County. And for economic health, we need to support the businesses that are already here in Whatcom County and also attract innovative businesses that will provide family wage jobs for us and our future generation. And like Atul was saying earlier, we need to first start with a solid foundation of um, infrastructure. And that infrastructure starts with broadband and fast, reliable internet service throughout the entire county. There's a lot of people in East County still practically dial up. So we need that in order for businesses to thrive. Um, so if we can have a county focused on health for individuals, the environment, and the economy, we'll have a Whatcom County where everyone has the opportunity to succeed. Again, I'm Carol Frazee, and I'd be honored to serve you on the Whatcom County Council. Thank you so much to both of you. And thank you, Christy Patum, for um, offering uh, to us the uh, thoughts of your husband's campaign. And we'll excuse you. Thank you. So, candidate Frazee, 
Timothy, it's all up to you now. Okay. But <laughs> I have to say I do better with competition, but okay. we'll have fun. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to make this, um, give you the best opportunity that we can to provide information to voters. Um, what work and life experiences do you think that you've had that will shape and inform your work for the council if you are the successful candidate? So, um, first of all, life experiences. I grew up on a farm and worked on a farm. And having that experience, and also being the first generation to attend college in my family, having those experiences, I feel like I have a broad view of what our, counter, our county encompasses. And you know, we have farmers here, we have colleges here, we have um, different, yeah, different opportunities. So those experiences, also as a business owner, I know what it, what it takes to start a business, and I also know what it takes when you don't have fast, reliable internet service. So I started my business online when my kids were little, I was home with them, and um, I saw a need for childhood obesity was increasing at a tremendous, uh, so fast. So I started a, anyway, I started a business online doing newsletters for schools all over the country to help childhood obesity. And I had to uh, use dial-up in 2004, and it was slow, and it was not good for business. What legislation would you make a personal priority to get passed, and why? I think, first of all, we need to figure out the jail situation. And I think the county council is working on that now and working together. Um, going to the, I went to three of the seven tours, uh, the criminal justice tours that they had all over the county. And people in Whatcom County value treatment over incarceration. That was the final vote. <laughs> That's what people want. And we need to take that into account and we need to start stop incarcerating people for drug addiction, for mental health, we need to start treating them. And two ways we can do that, we can have a data-driven assessment tool when people are, before they're booked into jail. So that takes out the, you know, the racial bias, first of all. Second, we need a pretrial service unit to help people get to make sure they get to their uh, trial, make sure they go to their drug treatment, all of that, because some people need that help. And yeah, so we value treatment over incarceration. That's what I want to help with. There are a number of tribal sovereign nations in Whatcom County. What role, if any, do you think the county has in creating or fostering relationships with the tribes and their members? Yeah, I'm honored to say that today I was endorsed by the Lummi Nation, and I want to make sure that we reach out, and instead of telling Nooksack um, Nation and Lummi Nation what they need, we need to reach out to them and ask them to, what, to tell us what they need. Um, we need to respect their rights and make sure that they are heard. Sometimes different communities communicate in different ways and we need to respect that and make sure they're heard. There's a lot of communities in Whatcom County that aren't being heard right now, two of them being Nooksack Nation as much and Lummi Nation. So making sure everyone gets a voice and reaching out to them directly. Do you think that the county has a role in creating additional housing units? And if so, what would that role be? I believe we have a role, I believe it's not only the government, though. We need to work with all of the, um, all of the, or not businesses, sorry, all of the nonprofits in that are already doing great work, and make sure we're working all together to make sure these units are right, like right now with the homes, um, the home fund that's happening in Bellingham, working with other agencies to make sure that people have homes that pe everyone should have a home. And how we do that, working together as a community, we can do this, we can figure this out. The 2018 Whatcom Community Health Assessment found that 30% of 18 to 34 year olds live in poverty. If elected, what would you as a county council person do to address this statistic? Can you repeat that one more time, 30%. Sure. The 2018 Whatcom County Health Assessment 
found that 30% of 18 to 34 year olds live in poverty. If elected, what would you as a county council person do to address this? One thing we can do to address the poverty for that age group, the 18 to 34, so that's the working, working age and families with young children is we need to make sure we're working with the port, working with the public utilities district, and the county council together to attract innovative industries and businesses here. Because we need to have family wage jobs in our area. Right now we don't. Also entrepreneurship, making sure we get broadband, fast reliable internet service throughout the entire county so that we can also have small businesses that can thrive online. I know several people who do a lot of consulting all over the world, right from Whatcom County. There's creative ways that people can have living family living wage jobs, and we can do that here in our county. According to the National Coalition to End Homelessness, the top five causes of homelessness, homelessness nationally are lack of affordable housing, lack of high enough living wage, domestic violence, medical bankruptcy, and mental illness. Which of these causes would you prioritize to address the growing homelessness problem in Whatcom County, and what specific actions would you take? Um, housing and health are intersecting. 41% uh, of the homeless in our county are suffering from mental illness. So mental illness would be the focus. We need to make sure we're treating individuals and also preventing. Preventing occurs when people are young, and I think we're doing a lot in this county for that to happen. But focusing on the mental illness and also uh, physical disabilities is 22%, but that 41% is really important and we need to focus on mental illness and we're seeing a lot more also in teenagers, so we need to make that a priority in our community. Well, that would segue nicely into my next question, which is it is generally agreed that available mental health services do not meet the need even for those available even for those able to afford private care. What action, if any, do you think that county government should take to increase the availability of such services to the community to provide mental health services? We are lacking in mental health services and attracting different forms and also, you know, we need to be creative on the county council and throughout our community. There's different way, you know, right now you have uh, people going out and providing showers in a truck. Um, also um, laundry, they're bringing laundry to people. So we need to be creative for things like maybe we need a service unit that goes out and maybe it's not the government, maybe it's not the county council, it is the different agencies. But coming together and thinking of creative ways where we can reach people where they are. Not like, oh, you need to come to us even though we don't have these buildings or services right now, but creative ways where we can go to people and help them directly. As to water, current efforts to restore Lake Whatcom water quality are mostly focused on stormwater facilities and water treatment upgrades, passing the cost on to all water users. What are your views on moving towards other alternative responses such as mandatory lakeshore revegetation? Yes. Um, we have a 50-year plan to clean up Lake Whatcom, and that is way too long. We need to speed up the cleanup. And one way we can do that is the HIP program, which is Homeowners Incentive Program. We're going around to each of the houses around Lake Whatcom, and they have incentives to put in different uh, vegetation and things like that to make sure that the water is clean and taken out the phosphorus before it's hitting the lake. Uh, we also buying more of the land with the Whatcom Land Trust, buying more of the land around Lake Whatcom so that we can, right now we can't protect it. They're, tr they're trying, you have to use it for something. So hopefully we'll figure out a way where we can actually just buy it to protect the water that we have. 
What actions will you take to secure the safety of Whatcom residents and their property and to protect our natural resources and environment from the potential hazards of transportation of fossil fuels through, to, and or from the county? This question includes current levels of fossil fuel transportation as well as potential future expansion through rail, pipeline, and shipping. Um, one thing I do is, when I value is the jobs we have at Cherry Point. We need to protect those. If we allow fossil, and I, I support the moratorium right now that, is, that they have, we do want to move in a more permanent direction with the Cherry Point moratorium so that, so that the Cherry Point industries can plan for the future, and so can we. Um, but with fossil fuels, if we can, we don't want unrefined fuels going just through, through the uh, refineries and out, shipped out, so that ships out the jobs. We would also don't want them on the trains uh, coming through Bellingham and beyond. So keeping that moratorium and figure out how to not have unrefined fossil fuels on our rails, on the ships, that will help protect the residents. The Cherry Point Industrial Zone was established 50 years ago to take advantage of its deep water port. As the world, national, and local economies evolve, what are your goals for using this area? So I would like, like I said, I, I want to protect the jobs that are in Cherry Point area. Right now, the, with, um, Right now, a person can go to Bellingham Technical College and come out in two years and make $42,000 per year there, which is more than the county council. Uh, but we, we want to make sure we have jobs like that. We could have solar there. We can have, uh, like Atul was talking about, different innovative industries can be there. It's a, you know, we have a port there. We have the industry uh, zoning. So we need to, be, like we said before, we need to be creative about what we attract there. And right now, the business count, the uh, business advisory council, is working with the port and the county council to, to try to attract innovative businesses that will provide uh, more um, environmentally sensitive uh, industries to the area. How would you approach the competing goals of protecting the agricultural land base in Whatcom County and providing non-agricultural or residential development in rural areas? Explain your position and provide any specific policies that you would advance. Can you repeat, sorry, can you repeat that question one I'd more time? I'd be happy to. Okay. How would you approach the competing goals of protecting the agricultural land base in Whatcom County and providing non-agricultural or residential development in rural areas. Explain your position and provide any specific policies that you would advance. Um, one thing we could do, uh, we want to keep the urban growth here and we want to protect that farmland. It is a, the farms here are the backbone of our county. Uh, they are beautiful, not only beautiful, but we need you know, fresh fruits and vegetables but we want to keep the urban growth in the city areas. So we can do the transfer of rights of property um, division, I have the word here right now, but the dividing the land. Some people have rights out in the county, bring them closer, they can sell them and bring them closer into the city areas so we can grow along the, um, in the town areas. So we have dense growth. So that's one thing we can do. And for a final question, what initiatives would you like to see the county take to improve racial and gender equity for those serving in county government and for those living in our community? One thing I would love to do to do racial, what was the other, you said racial? And racial and gender equity. And I'm going to say that we're going to do this without a closing statement this evening, so this will be your last question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So for racial and gender equality, uh, I would like to make sure that currently, like the business advisory group that was appointed by the port has um, no women that are voting members. And this was just made this year. I would like to see where we have equality 
in those advisory groups that are formed in our government, in our local government. We can do that. We can make sure, we can put policies in place to, and you might have to do on-ramps, not only take away obstacles for people, but on-ramps. So for instance, you're not having any women voting members, maybe it's the time of day, maybe it's how we are advertising. We need to reach out to people where they are. So we need to provide on-ramps and take away the obstacles. Well, thank you so much. And audience, please help me to thank candidate Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. So that concludes the evening's forums for today. In closing, I'd just like to make sure that we all offer our thanks and great appreciation to everyone who makes these forums possible again.